I hope that uh, you're enjoying uh, the inbound marketing event so far. Uh, if you're interested in interacting with others on social media, I'd encourage you to use the hashtag uh, inboundcon, uh, ha hashtag inboundcon, um, Twitter hashtag. Um, thank you once again to our sponsors, powered by Search and Abacus Data. Uh, the first panel discussion of the day will focus on enterprise SEO. Uh, it's being moderated by Dev Basu, the CEO of Powered by Search. You also have Vlad Rashkanu from Expedia Canada, Ken Fobert from Powered by Search, and Rick Jessup from Capital C. Um, before we get into it, I'd like to invite each one of them to say a couple of words about what it is that they do, and uh, then, uh, then, then uh, Dev will take over and moderate the panel. I'll pass it down to Rick, actually. Hey everyone, uh, Rick Jessup, I'm the Director of Digital Strategy at Capital C. It's a full service engagement marketing agency out of uh, the east side of Toronto. Uh, they've been around for about 25 years and so have I. So, uh, started uh, about 1994 online, did a, taught a class at Seneca on uh, search engine marketing in 1997. Uh, and then sometime around 2003 decided to let pay other people to do it for me, but hopefully I still have something to offer all of you today. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Ken Faubert. I work at Powered by Search as a SEO and inbound marketing consultant. Um, I got into SEO and online marketing in 2008, a little little later than Rick here. But, um, you know, it, turned, it, it started out as something as, you know, just, just being a hobby for me, doing it part-time and in my spare time, and turned out to some, be something that I was really passionate about. Um, and I worked at a few in-house in -house roles, and now I'm at, uh, proud to say I'm at Powered by Search. Uh, my name is uh, Vlad Ashkano. I'm also proud to say I used to work at Power by Search. <laughs> um, I started off in the industry actually Power by Search myself. Um, I learned everything I knew at the beginning from, from Dev. Um, and only about half a year ago I decided to move to uh, Expedia Canada. And right now I'm managing their uh, SEO channel in, um, for, for Canada. Hi, I'm Dev. You guys uh, have seen me up here this morning, but for some of you who have just arrived, um, I'm the president of Powered by Search. Um, I started from the bottom, now I'm here. <laughs> um, I started off in the SEO industry uh, over eight years ago, and um, something that really kind of piqued my interest and got me into it, I used to work in traditional marketing at uh, Microsoft. I'm an ex-Microsoftee. Um, and one of the things that we faced a challenge with uh, was we had some of our own customers. I used to work in the OEM channel, so this is basically where when you buy a computer, for example, and you have Windows preloaded on it, I used to be one of those guys that helped you know, Dell, MDG, Lenovo try to sell that. Um, and the story I always tell is that I used to have these resellers basically contact me and say, hey, where's the, the monthly marketing you know, promotion or special, for example, if I buy X number of SKUs, what can I tell my sales reps? Will, will they win a car, for example, if I meet sales goals? And the, the URL was one of those long cryptic URLs that nobody can ever really say on the phone, for example. And I always used to end up changing. So I just, at, at one point, I was just really fed up because this is like a an administrative type work where I just keep on sending the same URL to a bunch of people. And I said, why don't you search for it? And they said, well, we tried. And this was pre-Bing, basically. So I, the, the guy from Bing's over here, sorry. You know, this was before your time. Um, it was msn.ca. And I said, go search you know, the URL. Go look for Microsoft Canada OEM reseller portal. I couldn't find it. That's, what, that's the answer I got back. Um, so I said the words that I should not have said at Microsoft and probably why I'm not there anymore. I said, use Google. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they didn't find it on Google either. So that kind of piqued my interest and I said, if, if Microsoft's having these problems, if a company that owns a search engine is having its own problems, for example, um, I'm sure there are other corporations that have this similar type of, of problem as well. That piqued my interest and that's how I got into SEO. So with that, we'll kick off this session. So the session's called Enterprise SEO, all the big business tricks you can, you can use too. So the question is, um, how many of you actually work within the quote unquote enterprise, show of hands? Very few, right? So you're probably, the rest of you are wondering, what the hell am I doing here, right? So here's why I think this, this session's important for you um, if you don't work within the enterprise. Have you ever felt like big companies on Google had an unfair advantage? in terms of their rankings? Or have you ever felt like it was so damn hard to be able to get visibility on Google? Show of hands if you're a smaller company. 
Yes, it's true. So Google does prefer brands. Uh, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO, has gone on record to say that you know brands basically sort the cesspool of the web. So brands are the answer. Great brands surface up on top. They provide quality user experience, service, and products to people. And therefore, Google prefers great brands to be able to get the visibility that they do. So really, this session is about looking at three very different individuals. We all work with large brands, okay, including myself, but I won't be adding too much of my own input in here. Uh, so Vlad works now at Expedia, very large in-house operation. He's responsible for generating millions of dollars in revenue to Expedia. So if you ever booked a vacation and you've gone cheap flights to somewhere, for example, or vacations to Cuba, for example, I'm giving away all your, key your keywords, aren't I? Um, <laughs> you know, if you've done that and you found Expedia, he's responsible for that. So Expedia obviously has a, a lot of manpower, a big brand behind it as well. We're going to learn, hopefully, under, I know he's protected under NDA, but some secrets of what Vlad does at Expedia to be able to market it. Um, and then hopefully you'll be able to get some takeaways as well on how you can use the same types of strategies on your small business, a client, for example, for your own site. Um, Ken specifically works on more of the enterprise SEO channel at Powered by Search. Um, so we work with larger businesses, but we often take the same marketing plays that we can use for small businesses and apply it to larger ones. We'll understand the context of how do you translate from small to big and big back to small, which is applicable to a lot of the folks in the room today. And Rick comes at it from a completely different angle. He's a head of digital at Capital C, which is, would, it be, would I be correct in saying that digital is an you know, evolving part of your business, but the roots are still very much in traditional and mass? Roots definitely kind of, kind of experiential and kind of so forth, but digital is now over half the business. Right on. OK, so I'm going to start with a couple of questions over here. So for the, for the panel over here, what is the biggest advantage you think brands have big brands have in SEO? That Google likes us. We make a lot of money for Google, so Google uh, helps us make money in return. Um, that's just a short answer. But um, yeah, the, the biggest advantage that we have is indeed um, the late one of their algorithm updates, the Venice update is the one where they started, ever since they started to more or less favored the big brands and it's not because whatever I just said because we give them money it's more because we have a lot of content that we have to serve to to the visitors to people that are, are looking for whatever we have to offer more so than the smaller companies and because Google prefers content and we have millions and millions of pages to of content to offer to our visitors that's the reason why they they prefer the big brands um, and that's the main main advantage that we have. We have the power to generate tons of content, content which Google likes, and we have um, we have the budgets to to create um, great images, videos, uh, write great articles, find data on whatever we need. So, for example, if flights to whatever it may be, flights from Toronto to Cancun, Mexico, for example, we have any data that we need to offer to, to the visitors. We have how many flights there are from Toronto to Cancun, the size of the airports, we have uh, check-in times, we have rules and regulations, we have more information that we can offer to the visitors as some of the, the smaller guys can. And for that reason, Google prefers that type of content and that's our main advantage, I would say. Yeah, just building on what Vlad said, I think you know, big brands have have the budget to do. Um, you know, content marketing is something that's very, very big right now, and and brands have um, that budget to bring in content marketing teams and and do things on scale. Um, whereas small businesses have to work with, um, you know, obviously a lower budget, and and you have to be a little bit more creative when you're a small business. You have to do more with less. So, um, you know, big brands have, you know, there is. Um, you know, being a big brand, you still have those, all the red, the issue with the red tape where, you know, if you, if you want to get something implemented, it takes, it could take up to three months to get something passed through all the different, um, all the different departments. But, um, you know, just, just having that budget to work with, um, you know, as an SEO or an inbound marketing um, specialist, you have that um, that pool of knowledge in your in your teams you know you don't just have um, you know one or two people on your team you have you know you have creative teams you have 
um, marketing teams, uh, and you can build on that to do um, you know different types of content and and come up with a lot of different ideas. Uh, and, and you know, speaking about budget, you can you know pull from TV and print and and radio advertising that a lot of big brands have have the budget to do, and you can use that um, to your advantage online by um, presenting a consistent uh, a consistent brand message through all those different channels and bringing that online as well. <coughs> yeah, just uh, it almost echoes this, but it's it's time budget, it's dollar budget, and it's expertise. Uh, the only one that's really insurmountable is probably the dollar budget. Uh, these big brands are going to have a lot more money than you've got. Just means you got to be smarter. Uh, it comes to time budget. A lot of the smaller companies want to do it themselves. Uh, so you're, you know, you're building your own brand. You're doing your own marketing. You're doing your own social. You're doing SEO. You're plunging the toilets. Everything. Uh, it, it makes it difficult, and uh, that's where, especially when it comes to expertise and your time, uh, it's it's good to start looking at outsourcing things like that to people who really know how to do it. Uh, it gives you a bit more of a leg up. And uh, again, you can't really fight dollar for dollar but uh, you can beat them with your brain sometimes. So in the vein of inbound marketing, I still believe that SEO is a great equalizer. So I was at Seneca College yesterday uh, delivering a lecture on keyword research, and I specifically talked about how um, for the term barbecues, for example, bbqs.com actually ranks higher than Home Depot or Canadian Tire. And th that's just the power of, of focused SEO really at effect. You guys talked about content and how you need budget to do content. Um, one of the things that I've taught both of you before is you have to be scrappy when you're you're coming up with ideas, right? So what pretend you don't you didn't have the budget, right? So if you were to transplant yourselves from the types of clients you work with right now back to the days when you work with smaller businesses, for example, what are some of the lessons or learnings that you could think of right now that you could use to let, make some of the, the folks in the audience, for example, get scrappy with their content? Um, I mean, why would I want to give them advice on how to beat me? I mean, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I don't mind giving advice. Um, so basically, the the biggest advantage that small businesses have over enterprise is the fact that they can be agile, they can be fast, uh, they can be much more innovative usually um, than the guys, uh, you know, with with a budget. Because once we have budget. Um, we play it safe, we play it by the rules, we play it, you know, we just always, um, we, we can always fall back on the fact that we have budget, we don't have to be as innovative um, to do well because we can all, we always think back, oh, we have the budget, we just throw more money on it if, if there's ever an issue. Whereas small companies have that advantage that the fact that they have to work harder, try harder, be more innovative, be more agile, they all know that and they're all doing that and that usually works with, with the search engines um, because when, when you stick with strictly to the rules you're not going to be as far as ahead as someone that can bend the rules a little bit and do something more, more creative. Um, so. Um, to give you an example, for example, let's say we want to rank for, we have, we're Expedia, we have tons of lines of business, but we can't possibly do well in every single line of business. We have flights, we have vacations, we have uh, all-inclusive, we have packages, we have insurance, we have tons of lines of business. Um, whereas, for example, one company they may want to start, if they want to start with just one line of business and focus on that one line of business, um, they have more, they can allocate more resources to just that one line of business um, and they can um, throw more ideas towards it and be more innovative than just that one line of business, whereas we have to worry about everything else. At the same time, um, like Ken mentioned, we have a lot of red tape. Um, we have to wait a lot. So for example, if Google comes up with an algorithm update right now, we won't be able to act on it as fast as someone else may. So for example, right now, the Google Freshness algorithm update, there's a lot of small players that take advantage of that. Um, so they, they take advantage by posting a lot of reviews, updating their content often, setting up new sites, and taking advantage of the algorithm uh, and the fact that um, the Freshness update is a, is a big factor of the algorithm right at this moment. Me from Expedia, I can't really take advantage of that in any way because um, my teams won't move that fast. Um, I won't be able to set up 
new sites and, and try new things that easily. Um, I need a lot of permissions for, from a lot of different people. And from that, um, from that aspect, smaller guys can act a lot faster, a lot quicker, uh, try a lot more things than I can, um, and find out what works, what doesn't, a lot easier than, than I can from, from the enterprise side. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it is is being very innovative and creative and doing, you know, with a small budget, doing as much as you can with it. Uh, the th the example I always go back to is, I'm sure everyone in this in this room has heard of Dollar Shave Club, and you know they were a startup company that had nothing when they when they first started, but they put, um, you know, a marketing budget towards creating a really great piece of content which is that that one video that I'm sure everyone in here has seen and it's it's very witty and it's funny and it connected with their their core audience um, and it's it's something as as simple as just understanding your your audience you know um, you have to really spend some time understanding who you want to create content for um, you don't want to be creating content just to, just to create content I mean th there's there is some benefit to doing that but um, in terms of growing your business, you really want to understand um, understand the people that are, are connecting with your business, and you want to create content that um, that meets their needs um, and that will turn them into a customer. So, um, you know, we talked about enterprise having having the budget um, to do you know a lot of content at the same time, but there there is a lot of red tape that that can make that process a long process. Whereas as a small business, you can, um, you know, as Vlad said, be, be very agile um, and, and be creative, be smart with, with your money, you know, take, take a marketing budget for content and, and come up with, you know, four different pieces of content for, for a quarter and, and really put some time into, into researching your audience and, and understanding who you're creating content for. Yeah, don't, again, don't have too much to add to that other than uh, it is, it's speed. It's how quickly you can get things done and uh, get them through in the day job uh, for, for me to try and implement a big change, even a small change, to get an article out for uh, something that's going to drive attention to a 2300 multilingual page site uh, is going to take a brief and it's going to take someone writing it down, it's going to take three rounds of revisions, it's going to get all through this stuff, it's going to take three months. Uh, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't be a surprise. It could go quicker. Uh, you know, on, for, for me, you know, friends, family, I love to help them out. I help uh, my brother-in-law with a restaurant. I help my cousin with his photography business. Uh, we sit down and have a beer and go, you know what would be great is this article. We, we'd write about this and it'd probably help drive some attention on that word that you're, you're you know, getting all upset about. And we finish it by the end of the beer, right? So it's, it goes up. Those kinds of things where you can move pretty quickly uh, are going to be a little bit of a benefit. It's, you know, the multiple... Uh, little rocks in the slingshot that are eventually going to bring the giant down. Okay, so one of the things that I find with the difference between small businesses as well as the enterprise is not just, just budget. It usually, if you look at the definition between a startup and between an enterprise, for example, enterprises have got some things really figured out. Yes, they're slow, they're big, they have lots of budget, for example, but they also have the right people working on teams where there's a focus, basically, on each one of them. One of the things I find with small businesses often is that there's that like you said, you know, everything, you're, you're everything from CEO to janitor, for example. And so that often that means that you're spending time in low ROI places where you really should be outsourcing some of that or finding the right partners to work with and focusing on the high ROI initiatives. So for you guys, other than having money, for example, um, what are some of the high ROI activities that you spend time on when you're doing SEO? Oh boy. Um. I would still say content is gives you the biggest ROI. Um, I know I sound like a broken record, keep mentioning content, but that is because Google's fault. yeah, it's Google's fault. I blame it on Google um, and Bing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, content is having creative content can mean the world to to a small business um, and not just content itself, but being creative. I would say creativity it gives you the biggest ROI. Being creative, being able to come up with creative ideas. So to give you, uh, to give you an example, um, I know someone who basically had to, um, was trying to, had no budget to work with, 
and just wanted to had to basically get links, had to approach bloggers out there and try to get links for to his own site. Um, and of course, he wasn't allowed to pay the travel bloggers. Not sorry, it wasn't travel industry; it was a different industry. Um, had to pay. I'm, I'm used to saying talking about travel bloggers, but they're not. They're not travel bloggers. Um, he so basically, he wasn't allowed to uh, pay the bloggers any money at all um, because that's against the Google guidelines, and that's the only reason. Um, and uh, he he didn't know how to do it. So basically, what he did was he went to mommy bloggers. And for example, he found out that a lot of mommy bloggers don't have well-designed websites because they care a lot about the content that they put out there. They don't care so much about the design of the website itself. So once he picked up on that, he went to a bunch of different mommy bloggers and said, hey, you know what? I have a great content that you could put up on your site, but um, I can't offer you any money because all of them are asking for money. I can't offer you any money, uh, but what I can do is I can offer you a, a new banner that you can put up on your site because the one you currently have is not doesn't look that great. Or I can help you redesign. I can help you pick a new theme for your website that will look better than the one you currently have. It will bring more traffic to your site. A lot of, I mean, you can imagine about 80% of the time they would say, yeah, sure, because it's not much work for them to just copy paste an article on their site and at the same time get a new theme or get a new banner for their site that will look better than the one they currently have. So it's not much um, to think about when someone offers you that. So what this person did in exchange, they went on Fiverr and paid someone $5 to create a new banner, for example or found a, where he had resources where he could find new themes, great looking themes, and he went and you know got a free theme for her and sent it to her, or took the banner and sent it to her. So how much did it cost him? Five dollars. And anyone can really do that, right? And then he got a link that would originally be worth about $200, let's just say, you know, market value I'm talking about. So when I'm talking about content, I'm not talking about just content itself, putting up great content on your site because, you know, maybe no one's going to find it, but also you also have to be creative in the way you market that content and creative in the way you approach people with the content that you have. Um, so it's not just content alone, it's also the way you promote that content in the creative ways you can come up with to, to promote that content and get people to your site, which is execution is the most important thing in, in my opinion. Um, I think I have a question. Uh, what, in your, in, the, in your business, how do you produce content for the three maybe cycles of where the person is? But the tire picker, <coughs> The mid searcher, and then maybe the final, the final. How do you are you producing separate kinds of content for each of those part of a buy cycle? Like I I'll give you an example. I'm looking for a crew. Mm -hmm. I'm looking uh, now. I'm looking for a carnival crew. Now I'm looking for a Caribbean crew uh, that costs seven hundred fifty dollars. How, how do you produce content that matches each of those segments of a buyer's mindset? It's a good question. Um, basically, it's a bit more difficult to answer because we don't look at content that way. We look at, we have the launch pages, we call them the launch pages, so basically the main vacations packages page, hotels page, flights page. Those pages, of course, attract most traffic because when someone starts to search for something, they start searching for hotels. Hotels in or in a different continent or whatever they may search or flights or just flights or cheap flights, cheap hotels, whatever they may search. So they start with short tail searches, one or two words generally. And those launch pages for us grab all that traffic. Then we move them, then the other, the rest of the traffic we grab it with, let's say, say we call them second year pages, we, let's say country pages, province pages, state pages, whatever it may be. Um, if they want to get more granular, or we also have the city pages, for example, Toronto hotels, let's just say. So we grab, if someone's searching for cheap Toronto hotels, we grab that kind of traffic with a Toronto hotels page. We then have filter pages such as neighborhood pages, star rating, uh, star rating pages, uh, we have um, brand pages, uh, we have um, theme pages, so anything you type, 
uh, Pet Friendly Hotels Toronto, um, North York Hotels Toronto, Downtown Toronto Hotels, whatever you may type in, we have pages for each type of search queries that people may type in. And um, I don't know if we would have specific content written specifically to sell the customer on depending on which stage of the process they're in, but we have pages with content for those specific stages of of their their, their buying cycle. Um, <clears throat> so what was the, the the best return on investment so strategy? How do you focus on high ROI activities versus eliminating the low ROI. So what should you essentially outsource and what should you as a business owner or a marketing manager, for example, spend most of your time on related to SEO? Um, I think, in my opinion, for me, one of the biggest things you can do is, is build relationships in your industry with um, you know, influencers in your industry. Um, and and you know, it's, it's something that, um, I don't know if I should talk about this, but as, as powered by search is something that we've we've put some some time and effort into is is becoming part of the community learn you know meeting new people in our industry putting putting on these you know these um, these marketing conferences that we that we do and it it it, it, it helps us you know branch out and and it can form new partnerships for the business um, and it's it's something that it it's not specifically for you know your website, but as part of an overall overall strategy, it helps to to you know it it makes us um, you know a lot of people would look at us as as thought leaders in the SEO space. You know, we put on this is the first inbound marketing conference that um, that has been in Canada, I think, and um, you know building that that community. Um, for your business is something that in the long run will will help the business grow and help your brand um, and then another another thing that I that I spend a lot of time doing is is focusing on your actual the the architecture of your website so if you think about um, if you think about a car um, you have you know the car the wheels everything and then you have your engine think about your website being the car and then Technical SEO being being your engine. If your if your website isn't functioning properly, if if search engines can't crawl and index your you know important content on your website, um, it's not going to do very well. So if your engine isn't running very well, which is is you know how your website runs, then your your car is not going to get very far, right? So if you think about it that way, um, you know, spending time building building relationships in your industry and focusing on really understanding how your website um, interacts with search engines and optimizing that will have um, a really positive effect on on your business and your website. Content strategy, uh, rather than you know when I was doing things on my own, it was very easy to come up with a great idea because and, and it was zero rounds of revisions because I was doing it all alone, and it would just fire it out. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Now, uh, understanding the value of of who am I actually trying to reach? And, and the Bill Cosby quote earlier was perfect. Who, who am I actually trying to get to? Uh, what's going to get them excited? What do they want to see? Uh, balance that against, and we've talked a lot about search. We haven't talked much about social, which is an area I play a lot in, which I would still count in here. Uh, that content's got to go all over the place. So uh, the kind of content I'm going to create um, to, to, to drive search traffic is going to be different than the content I'm going to create for Instagram. It's going to be different than the content I'm going to create for Facebook. And having that strategy in place that says who am I trying to reach, what are my objectives, uh, what's that one key insight for each of these places that's going to play off of that, uh, and then how, you know, how do I go about creating something that, you know, daily is going to resonate with this audience. And, and some, you know, right now I'm working on a project that's hedging my bets that uh, potentially Facebook will become an area people search for things locally. Doesn't happen now. Facebook wants it to be that way. Uh, we've got a client who's willing to say, you know what, yeah, let's throw some dollars against that in hopes that at some point when I load up my Facebook app, I might try to find something local to me or I might be able to hijack that traffic from a multinational firm into a, a branch or a, uh, one area. And so those kinds of things don't come out of just kind of sitting in a room and high-fiving and saying, that's brilliant, let's do it. Uh, it's actually understanding who are, you know, what's the audience of this, this particular client we're going after. Uh, that 
is an area probably largely today owned by uh, whether it's you know firms like Powered by Search right through to firms like ours. Uh, but there is absolutely no reason why those of you who have a company with two people in them can't spend uh, a lunch going out for a couple hours to a great pub and sitting down and really starting to do that research and figuring out what it is that the people you're trying to reach want to see. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard. We make it hard. Uh, you know, what do you want to see? How do I get it to you? Because I have something you want. And we, we, we lose sight of that because we, you know, let's put cats up because people love cats and it's Pinterest, so we should pin lots of cats. That might make sense. It probably doesn't. Just to summarize, the highest um, ROI you guys have seen is more content, partnership, and, and social? Well, specific, so for mine would be, would be content across the board. Like we, we do content and, you know, oh, so, a infographic that we think will resonate with search um, that we wouldn't necessarily place on uh, Instagram. So, so it's more content than SEO now yeah. because of Google. I, I would say that well, the, the content has to be with SEO in mind, has to be done with SEO in mind at the same time because if no one can find that content, then what's the point of the content, right? Um, also, if you write content for, like, like we said, for the wrong audience, the, if the person, if you don't know if the person is interested in that, and you can only find that by using the keyword tool uh, for Google and Bing, of course, um, or a YouTube tool, um, then you don't know what kind of content to write. So whenever you do write content, you always has to be with the customer in mind, with with the SEO best practices in mind, um, to be able to make sure that the customer finds that kind that content. So, so, so to sum up, targeted content and purposeful content. So the right content for the right user at the right time in the right place in the channel where they consume it. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. How many of you have great ideas on a daily basis? Show of hands. Keep your hands up if you actually have the time to execute on them. Okay. I used to be you until I found the power that is the marketing assistant. <laughs> so. To be honest with you, get out of the building, okay? You've already demonstrated that you have the power and the intent to do that You're here today. Go find some young, very, very enthusiastic people who want to help you meet your goals, to, you know, to be on that journey with you. These are the people that will soon to be your, become your full-time hires. And um, one of the things that we experimented with, with when we were a, a much smaller agency is we allowed people who had no experience basically in SEO to come into our space and say, we're going to teach you everything we know. And for all we know, you might go to somewhere else, for example, it might be a competitor. We never said you can't go do that. It was an intern program, and it's turned out to be one of the best things we've ever invested in. Um, and we've had people who've gone through that program, done fantastic work, not the type of work where they're getting us coffee, for example. That's that's not the type of low versus high ROI activity I'm talking about. But these are people who have helped us really push the bar, including this conference today could not have been possible without our, our marketing assistants and SEO assistants. So go find that intern, the person who actually wants to help you, and treat them like an equal. Treat them as a, a very much a mentor-mentee relationship, and you'll find that you'll get over some of your time-based challenges where you can actually take an idea and have the execution done by somebody else. That's exactly how Small companies become medium-sized companies, and medium-sized companies become big-sized companies because the, the ones that grow know how to delegate and also support those they delegate to along the way. Okay, so with that, I'm going to open. We talked a lot about content, guys, okay? So I don't want to harp on about that particular topic. Um, I want to open it up to some challenges that you guys face on a day-to-day -day basis with SEO. So maybe just a, it's an audience question that we would take, and you can leverage some of the knowledge that these fine gentlemen have on the panel because they weren't always working with sort of the, the Fortune 1000. Many of them got their start working on a mom-and-pop shop. And that might be who you are working with right now, and you might be working slightly sort of more upstream, for example, but they've got that knowledge and that, that experience, for example, to help you in whatever situation you're in right now. So, question. It, it, it's not fair to put a dollar figure on everything, but for a local business doing a basic service, what should they really expect Repeat. to pay for their SEO? Is it $300 a month, $500 a month, $3,000? Because really, they're substituting what they used to spend on yellow pages now to SEO. Right, so the question is, 
how much should small businesses, what, sort, what range should be looking to spend in SEO services if they're a small business and they may not necessarily have as high of a budget as enterprise and of course, whenever they pay for the SEO services, they take money out of their own pockets, not out of the company's budget, so then they have to be much more careful with how they spend their money and uh, who they spend it with. Um, that's the correct question, right? Um, the answer to that is, um, First of all, you have to do a lot of research to see what's, what's in the market out there. Um, an exact dollar figure is really difficult to come up with, but I would say, I would say don't underspend in SEO because SEO is probably the most important channel. SEO gives you the highest ROI per dollar, long term, guaranteed. Doesn't matter who I've worked with, mom, pop shop, medium-sized company, large-sized company, B2C, B2B, doesn't matter who I worked with, SEO, long-term, and I'm talking here, it's the key word, long-term, um, by far has the, low, the highest ROI from all the, the marketing channels. Um, so having said that, don't underspend in SEO. Don't look for the three, $400 deals that are out there. Um, what happens is when you go to those sort of very low budget agencies that are promise you good services for three, four, five hundred dollars a month and they guarantee you results and they sell you on their customers got here and here and all the great results they got for four or five hundred dollars a month, um, personally I would suggest to stay away. Um, what happens is um, a lot of those agencies, and I can't speak for every single agencies, but, uh, agency, but some of those agencies will try to automate some of the systems in order to be able to uh, be profitable at that $500 range, for example, a month. Um, as soon as they start to automate the system, um, they start to cut corners. When they start to cut corners and automate things, um, a lot of those things will become against Google guidelines. When you play against Google's guidelines or Bing's guidelines, of course, as well, um, long term, your site, you may risk getting your own site penalized. Um, either manual penalty, automatic penalty, whatever it may be. Long term, you always have that risk. Um, when it's your own business, you have um, you know, family to feed, you have uh, to keep a roof over your head. Um, I wouldn't suggest being that risky and, and going with those, risking um, your website because most likely it's the one that generates the most traffic, the most leads for you as a small business. I wouldn't um, be, be that risky. Um, if possible, I would try to spend more and I would suggest to be very patient. Make sure you pick the right agency and be very patient. Um, SEO is like Dev, like I learned this from Dev, the saying from Dev, uh, SEO is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, so keep going at it, be patient, make sure you pick the right agency and be patient with it. Uh, because if you also if you pressure your agency to, to get you good results at a low budget, what they're gonna do again, they're gonna feel pressure, they're gonna try to keep you on board, they're gonna try to cut corners as well. So make sure you pick the right agency and be patient with them. And the, mo the more you can spend, in SEO services, the better it is because um, the more you can spend, the more content they can create for you, um, the more resources they can put on your account, um, the more creative they can get with your account, they can try new things, they can test new things, they can try uh, stumble upon and see you know, how many social media signals they can get through stumble upon, they can try a Facebook campaign to see if that can generate leads for you, they can try a small pay-per-click campaign, if you're a B2B they can try a LinkedIn campaign, pain, um, so they can try many different things for you, uh, if you if you have the right agency that you're working with. So in my opinion, the more money you can spend, the better. Just make sure you spend that money in the, with the right agency. Okay, if I should pass it on. Or? Do we want to? Because I mean, um, yeah, I mean. Maybe short and sweet. I want to take, I want to be able to take more, more audience questions. <coughs> Yeah, okay. Um, like Vlad said, it's very hard to put a, a dollar figure to that. Um, you know, if, if you talk to an agency and they tell you they're going to build a thousand links for your website in a month and they're charging you 150 bucks, be very wary. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, if you're still advertising in the yellow pages, I mean, 
put that market, to put that budget into um, investing in SEO. That's that's where the future of, of marketing is. You can track it. Um, you can determine your return on investment. Um, and like Vlad said, look for an agency that connects with you um, on a personal level as well as a business level um, and find that right agency for your business and, and go for it. Do you want to see? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. The, the first thing I'd say is this. Before you switch your money out of anything else in any other channel, how many of you can truly tell me how much money your website generated last month? Show of hands. Okay, very few. So most of you, and, and to be honest, it's a very big challenge. We've been doing a study where we find that 70% of marketers know that marketing works. They just don't know what particular channels work or what the cost per lead is or what kind of revenue they get. It pays to get a consultant in to make sure that you have a good web analytics uh, practice, basically. To actually not just open up Google Analytics, for example, when, when and as and when you sort of want to or when you feel like your business is in trouble, but do it well before. Make it a, just like you've got morning meetings, for example, book with, let's say, your accountant, your financial advisors, your partners, make sure you have an analytics meeting because that will give you a new level of clarity into what channels are working well for you. Uh, and it's money very, very well spent because sometimes you'll figure out that maybe you're spending money with the yellow pages and it's $10,000 per month and the sales rep is telling you that it's really working for you. But if you added something like a call tracking number to see how many phones, phone calls you actually get or you looked at your Google Analytics and you saw that yellowpages.ca is the 15th or 20th highest referrer of traffic to your site, you can make some logical decisions at that point of time. But the point is, let the data do the talking, right? So um, in God we trust and all others we trust data. So remember that data is the biggest thing in being, being able to have your inbound marketing be successful. Okay, so I'll open up to another question in the back over there. Yeah, you guys, you guys mentioned earlier about the website architecture. And one of the things I struggle with is we have content, but my understanding is that Google ranks pages as opposed to a collection of pages. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because do I want to make one really awesome guy? Do I want to make like five guys? Or do I want to make guys that are focused on particular keywords? You know what I mean? How does Google look at the collection of your domain as a whole versus individual pages on your website? And how should you approach that from the website architecture perspective? So I'll just repeat that question and sort of summarize a little bit. The gentleman over here had a question about if you have a great content idea, for example, uh, and we know that Google likes web pages, not websites, basically, uh, and they rank the actual pages, is it a better idea to actually create an uber large guide, for example, that exists on one page, or to break up the guide into multiple different pages so that you can get ranked for more keywords and get more overall organic traffic? It depends on what your goals are. Um, if your main goal is to get traffic through that blog post, for example, straight from Google, then I would make it a 2,000 word page um, uh, blog post, uh, 3,000 word, and that blog post over time will become more and more authoritative. As it becomes more and more authoritative, um, it will start ranking for different types of long tail keywords and it will generate long tr uh, a lot of long tail traffic for you in the long run. Um, if you're looking to um, engage the audience, if you have something really interesting like a story to tell and you want to engage the audience, then you can also just make it a, a five week guide or a five week whatever it may be, uh, lesson, story, whatever it may be, and you want people to keep coming back, um, then that's a different story. You can also use the rel, prev, rel, next tags to make sure Google still sees it as a one page. Um, so from an SEO standpoint, it really doesn't matter uh, because you can, make it, you can make it so that Google sees it as a one page, even if you have five individual pages. Um, but if you, so it really depends on what you want to do. Um, if you want to engage the audience and you have a story to tell or whatnot or a guide, then I would do it five pages and use the rel, prev, rel, next tags to make, it, uh, make sure that Google, sees, Google and Bing see it as a, a one page. Um. If it, it, like Vlad said, it does dis, it depends on, on what your goals are, but um, if you have, um, you know, a guide that is a few thousand, you know, a few thousand words long, and um, I would suggest breaking that up into, you know, a series of, of blog posts. So, and that, 
and that way you can space it out over you know a different amount of weeks and um, if you can initially get interest in that blog post with the first part of the series um, and, and get people to share that on social media. Um, it'll build more anticipation and more interest on the following and subsequent pages um, and, and parts of that series. So, um, you know, you could do something as, um, I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with Moz. Uh, they're a big SEO company. Um, but they have this, this guide. It's called the Beginner's Guide to SEO. And it teaches um, SEO to, to beginners and talks about the basics. Um, and what, it, what they've done is basically made a mini, a mini website for this guide. There's, I think there's 10 different chapters. And um, you know each chapter is on something different. So if this guide. Um, that's that's another way you can go is create sort of a mini site and it, it, it allows you to have more pages indexed rather than one blog post um, index in Google. You can have many different pages around different topics um, that are covered in the guide. So um, it allows you to attract more long tail keyword traffic to, to your website through different, uh, a different amount of pages. No, oh, no? okay. Yeah, so I, I, the only thing that I'd add over there is, again, it depends on the type of content you're generating uh, more than just even the goal. First of all, bravo for putting together or thinking of putting together a long form piece of content. It's the type of stuff that people really love. You can see this even in the early years of Google. Has anybody here heard of Steve Pavlina? Yeah, so Steve Pavlina, productivity blog. He talks about um, a lot of different kinds of things like life hacking, for example, how to get better sleep, how to wake up on time, how to be motivated, how to get out of depression, for example, those types of things, right? Real self-help self productivity type stuff. But one of the cool things about Steve's blog is that his average blog post length is something like 7,000 words. So, and he does not break it up. And it, it's got subheadings, for example, but that's about it. It's not broken up into different pieces of content. And the only thing that I'm trying to illustrate over here is don't build the content for SEO, infuse SEO into the content and build the content for the user. And so whatever your user likes better is what you should do. And why, the reason why I say that, it's not just a, a fuzzy marketing type, you know, lovable content feel that I want to attach to it. But the fact is, Google's got actually data on whether you can quantitatively analyze whether a user loves your content. They can look at things like bounce rate, for example. Because you've got Google Analytics on the site, they can know what sites, what pages they visited prior to the, visiting that content page, what pages they visited after. They know what other sites you visited, for example. Um, Google Chrome, by the way, um, for the conspiracy theorists in, in here, is actually claimed by some SEOs as being Google's headless browser. So just like you guys might have heard of uh, Google basically sending little spiders out to understand your website. And people have, for, for the longest time, basically thought that Google can only understand text and links, for example, and maybe sometimes images. But I can assure you they're a lot smarter than that. When you go on a Google search result and you click sort of, you don't even click, but you kind of hover over the search result, have you seen the preview that comes up sometimes? And it's got an entire home page preview, for example. You'll notice now that they can even get the image of something that's in Flash, which they were previously unable to read. So where I'm going at with this is, Google can measure whether your content is lovable. So create the content in a way that would be best consumed by whoever your target audience is. Cool, okay, so I think uh, with that, We'll have another question or not? One more question. Um, my question is about uh, knowing and monitoring the best practice of SEO. Uh, if you could in a nutshell itemize that if I am as a company wanted to outsource the SEO, I need to know a little bit about it to be able to see or to be able to understand what the, uh, what the person is talking about, what the specialist is talking about and be able to monitor that in my own expertise as to, okay, he's doing a, you know, an okay job and, uh, and you know, I can move forward with this, with this person. Sure. I'm challenging that. I do not want to be a specialist in SEO. I don't want to be a specialist in SEO, but I do want to make money out of this SEO, maybe, maybe through um, a white labeling or something like that. And I just need to, and there are a lot of um, millions of articles about SEO, good or bad. Can you itemize these are the factors that you need to know and these are all it's linked together and that's all you need to know to be able to do it? Okay, so the question, I'll summarize it is, as a small business owner, for example, or somebody who does not want to live their lives as an SEO or inbound marketing specialist, for example, or expert, what are some of the key things you need to know that are important from an SEO perspective that you will use to evaluate somebody who's helping you with your SEO? Do you want to uh, take that? Go ahead. Um, 
I guess to, to itemize it, the number one thing that you'd want to look at is um, you have to, together with whoever you've hired for to do your SEO, you have to come up with whatever you know search terms that you think your audience are going to search for online. Um, you know, you want to understand how people are going to find your website. Um, you might think that some of your consumers are going to use a specific type of, of search or, or keyword and you know, you, you give that data to the, the person that's doing SEO for you to give them kind of a guiding hand um, and then they'll take that and, and, and look at data online of what people actually are searching for in your industry. So what you might think people are searching for might be totally different. You, you know, you might have a keyword or a search in mind um, of what people will search for to find your business or your service and, and you know, you'll give that information to your SEO and he'll go and do, he or she will go and do the research and it might turn out that maybe five people search for that per month. Give them a guiding hand to, to you know, find out what people are going to actually search for to find your business. Um, and they'll optimize your website with, with that knowledge and with that data um, to make sure that your website does show up for, for search terms that consumers are actually using. Um, Apart from that, on an ongoing basis, for for measuring your success with SEO, you really want to look at um, the amount of, if you have, you should have a web analytics software, first of all, installed on your website. Um, you want to look at the amount of, of traffic that's coming to your website from organic search. So that's from, you know, Google, Bing, Yahoo, um, any other type of, of search engine that is sending you organic traffic. You want to look at that traffic and, and see that increasing on a monthly basis. And majority of the time, you want to look at um, non-branded searches. So people that are not they don't necessarily know your brand or your business so they're searching for um you know service type keywords if you're um you know if you're a coffee shop maybe it's someone typing coffee shops in toronto um, maybe they don't know the name of your business but you want to make sure that um, traffic like that that is non-branded search is increasing to your website month over month all I'd add to that is just uh, if you're looking at a company, someone that's going to work with you, treat them like you would an employee, hire them that way, uh, get them out somewhere, talk to them. And one of the seediest ways I go about doing this is if they give me a company that they've worked with, I contact the company. Uh, get some reference, find out what other people think about them, and uh, just make sure that you're about to get in bed with the right people. All I'd add to that is that no matter who you, when you hire a lawyer, for example, you don't question how the lawyer learned law, right? Okay, but you can't, you're in a position when you're hiring a lawyer to ask them stupid questions. And the truth is there is no such thing as a stupid question, okay? So similarly, when you're hiring a consultant, any consultant, a freelancer, an agency, you know, in-house for example, there is no such thing as a stupid question. So ask as many as you possibly can. And it's not your job to be able to ramp up in being able to understand how SEO works. It's their job to be able to explain it to you in a layman's fashion so that they speak your language and what makes your business tick. Right? And for doing that, sometimes you need to tell them what your business challenges are, what your goals are, what you are good at, what you're not good at. So we ask our clients straight up, like, how internet savvy are you? If you still say the word hits when you're describing traffic to your website, there's some education that needs to happen. And so good SEOs will always include education as part of whatever they're doing for you, even if they don't necessarily bill for it. Okay, so with that, I think we'll, we'll take a break and we'll have lunch from um, now until one. We'll be back for enterprise PPC ch challenges and solutions. I'm sure a lot of you do things like Google AdWords or Facebook advertising or LinkedIn and have a bunch of questions about it. Enjoy lunch. And we can answer whatever questions you guys may yeah, have. Yeah, we'll, we'll be around to answer more questions, including myself as well.